makes their that makes their system available to amateurs anywhere at no cost. Um, so there, there are a couple of advantages here. Number one is the no cost, but secondly, as opposed to uh, US uh, government observatories or National Science Foundation funded observatories, uh, there's no international limits on who can access it. So what I thought I would do today is uh, tell you a little bit about the observatory, its background, uh, what they do, and then uh, run you through a fairly quick demonstration of how you can access it. I've already posted on chat all the links you need to get into the system. And also my email is there. So if afterwards anybody has questions, please feel free to drop me an email and be glad to talk to you about it. So with that, let me give you a little bit about the background on what this place is and where they are. I'm going to start off by not having any sound related to this, uh, but once we get to the observatory, um, uh, we'll um, try to turn on the sound so you can see what's happening. Okay, where is the observatory? It's right here in North Central Netherlands. Does everybody seeing the screen? It should be a map. Yes. Okay. Um, the name of the observatory is the C.A. Muller Radio Astronomy Site or System. Uh, it's uh, C-A-M-R-A-S, uh, pronounced, I believe, in native Dutch as Camra, without the S being pronounced. It's in the town of Vingelo, which begins with a D-W in the spelling. And if Wolfgang could help me with any Dutch mispronunciations I have, I'm sure you're familiar enough with Dutch. You can help me out. It's uh, Dwingelo. That's uh, right over. Yes. And it is located about 300, 325 kilometers north of uh, Wolfgang's site down here at uh, Astropila uh, uh, Stockard. So I think the way Wolfgang would drive, it would be about a three hour drive. The way I would drive, it'd be about a six hour drive. So it's fairly centrally located for anybody in Europe needing to actually visit the site. One of the things they offer, and we can see on their website in a moment, is in-person visits, in-person science experiments to be done using all their instruments. Uh, there's a sign-up form and a, a uh, essentially a price list for what you want to do. Anything from meals and lodging to um, simply access to one of their instruments. So here is their website. If we have switched screens here. So you should be seeing a site that says astronomy over here. And at the top, in very tiny letters, the name of the site. They do have a ham radio call sign that is shown on the list up here. And to get to this web page, this is their main homepage, um, you can um, um, uh, find that link on chat. So um, the first thing to keep in mind with this um, website is it's got a lot of stuff. The main menu is over on the right side here, but don't let that fool you. Uh, these are, are kind of the main topics that the public would be interested in. Everything for um, a description of what radio astronomy is to how radio meteors are tracked to um, SETI and uh, SETI programs at uh, Vingelo. But 
some of the most interesting things are up here in this little almost hidden menu. And one of the most interesting, so every one of these tabs is worth study. You could spend probably an entire two hours on this tab about the radio telescope. It tells you a lot about the history of radio astronomy under the accidental discovery, and it certainly was no accident, but they go into quite a bit of detail of uh, Hank van de Holtz and how through the late 1930s and throughout the 1940s, he did the calculations for the uh, resonant frequencies for hydrogen, uh, several molecules, and about a half a dozen other elements. And uh, actual photographs that I had never seen before of uh, Van de Holtz and um, uh, Jan Oort discussing how they might go about discovering um, uh, that uh, the, the actual emissions themselves. Um, further down, you can see actual photographs of this observatory being built in the mid 1950s. But prior to that, and very significantly, the observatory obtained uh, access to several Würzburg radar units from World War II um, and repurposed them for radio astronomy. Now, Van de Holtz and Oort wanted to put them on 21 centimeters. The dishes, the screens, the feeds had been built for about 500 megahertz or um, um, 50 centimeters. So uh, they had to do quite a bit of modification. Their limitation, and they would have been the first people to actually record um, 21 centimeter emissions except for the fact that nowhere in the world, except at Harvard University, was there a low noise amplifier um, suitable for discovering uh, that emission. Um, so Van de Holtz and Oort worked really hard for a couple of years because they knew the signal was there, but they just didn't have the LNA that would allow them to do it. Uh, when Doc Ewan and his group at Harvard used a fairly small horn to discover it, um, then indeed uh, Van de Holt's theories were uh, substantiated and everybody around the world knew they could do it. It was just a matter of amplifier um, advancement. And lo and behold, within a very short time, uh, Netherlands got copies of good LNAs and one of the early accurate star maps was done from this observatory that we're going to be visiting. By the time they got the LNA, the Würzburgs had been replaced by a 25 meter fully steerable dish. And in one of these links, you can see the royal family of the Netherlands visiting the observatory and I'm sure it was a staged shot, but the, uh, uh, the queen herself throwing the power switch to turn on the observatory. So just very interesting history, some beautiful movies in here, and uh, something that um, I think all of us ought to be interested in just from the history of our professions and hobbies. Well, that said, how do you get to the actual observatory itself? Well, there's a real prominent link up here in I think font size two that takes you there. And if you see what I'm circling, that's it. It's the top of all their pages. Um, and lo and behold, it will take you there. There's a direct link on our chat in case you can't read that. So let's go see what we can do. The first thing you'll notice is that in the upper left corner is a tab that says start audio. Now for most radio astronomy observations, we don't care about listening to audio, but the, this site is using um, web SDR software 
to control the site. And because of that, um, the standard way of uh, creating your actual link is to start the audio. So let's do that. The next thing you would do is um, put in either your name or call sign. And this, I hope, will become um, clear later why that's an important thing to do. Uh, number one, it helps uh, the people in, at uh, Vengalo in tracking who has been on, how long they stayed on, and what they did. But also, it lets other simultaneous users of the system know what you're doing. There will be a panel that you'll see in a few minutes with our call sign, or if you don't have a call sign, put in your name, name of observatory, just something to identify yourself. Um, and in that panel, you can see what the person is doing. So in the background, you may be able to hear my audio over my speaker because I'm actually hearing it. I could feed audio um, over our share screen, but, uh, then you would lose my microphone. So what are some of the things you can do? This panel here lets you select what you are listening to and what this waterfall is displaying. Among the things are 70 centimeter earth, moon, earth uh, radio bounces. Just the regular 70 centimeter generally ham band, the two meter generally ham band, the Graves radar frequency, which is also near two meters, the six meter ham band. That becomes important because the um, Belgian Brahms meteor radar system operates there, as well as uh, now there are two or three British. Uh, amateur radar, uh, amateur meteor radar transmitters on six meters. And then as a special treat for us, um, we can listen to the telemetry, at least the analog telemetry and beacons from the Artemis mission. Of course, this will only be up while Artemis is uh, running, but um, this will be replaced by other investigations that people are running at the site itself. So let's see if we can get anything at all from Artemis. This panel shows you the 25 meter uh, dish and gives you its RA deck and it is now tracking. So it is tracking Artemis. And I'm not sure if you can hear any squeeches and uh, squeals from this, but Artemis um, is sending what appears to be on the waterfall as a digital um, uh, telemetry pattern. It's fairly broadband, um, and we can listen to various portions of that. Somewhere in here, if one knew the exact frequency, you could find the main beacon. There's not much we can do with that other than say, yeah, Artemis is alive and I'm listening to it. But as other experiments are going on at uh, Vingalo, you should be able to monitor those remotely and record. There's a recording uh, mode that we'll get to in a second. Should be able to record it. Now, a few things, depending on which browser you're using, you may need to change the way the waterfall and sound is processed. I, my browser uses HTML for both, but some browsers may require Java. So if you're a, a Java uh, browser, um, uh, your um, browser requires Java, just simply uh, click on those and you can change the format. You can either allow your keyboard or not. I don't need it for this. Um, and uh, you can restrict what your view is going to be. All bands or just some bands. 
And by not selecting um, those, what I'm doing is just going one band at a time, makes it much simpler to keep up with. You have control over the bandwidth and modes of the receiver, AM, FM, sideband modes, um, CW. Uh, you can manually type in a frequency or you can use the up and down buttons. You can access the memories. If you want to uh, log something, um, there, there's a log form that is interactive. You can just type in whatever you want. And then at the bottom of, or near the bottom, uh, this is where your call sign comes into place. I'm not sure if you can read the small type here is K0LTO, which is the radio call sign for Little Thompson Observatory. And for all the people who are simultaneously online using the system, and there are a total of seven users, so there would be six people in addition to me, we can see them, they're showing up in different colors here. Um, we can see where they are, who they are, and what they're doing with the system. So it looks like uh, quite a few people are in and around Artemis. Um, we remember I used the slider to change the frequency a little bit. So we're listening to something different than those two people. They probably know something about Artemis that I don't know, and they're either on the beacon channel or um, a telemetry, analog telemetry that they may be able to record. At the very near the bottom of the screen is a chat box. Uh, you're welcome to post anything you want to here. This is the entry line. Um, you can post into the chat box, and there's some fairly useful information as you scroll back through. Uh, there's an explanation uh, or a link to an explanation of the Artemis mission, as well as some radio frequencies of meteor radars. I believe from what I saw earlier, all these frequencies have already been put into the uh, memory banks. And so if we leave Artemis, and go over to uh, six meters, for instance. Here are the memory banks. And we can go see if anybody is receiving anything at all on, uh, should have moved. So through my speaker, I'm getting a loud squeal, which is indicating some kind of a carrier on this particular frequency. Uh, by going to these others, uh, we can check out the various um, meteor radars in Europe. So Brahms, as well as the amateur radio meteor uh, sites are all in the memory banks. Going to the Graves radar, which is really, really interesting. Um, this morning, uh, they were having good meteors there. You got a lot of very, very loud pings. Uh, those of you who are familiar with the system know the transmitter is down in France. So it's just about an ideal distance away from uh, Vengalou. Um, uh, so we were both hearing and seeing uh, meteor reflections on this line. You're seeing this waterfall, which scrolls from the bottom to the top. Um, meteors will show up here just as they would do on any other um, waterfall system. You can adjust the waterfall to your preference. If you want, you can start an audio recording, which will record your local computer. And you can get a signal strength plot also recorded. So for most of what we do, I think you would want the signal strength plots. Um, for demonstrating 
uh, radio meter meters to someone, you probably would want to do the audio recording or at least play back the audio. I have not yet found a way to turn the audio off on my speaker. Once I have clicked this button that used to be up here, you lose it once you click it. So you can't disable the audio, but all you can do is use your own local uh, speaker control and turn down the volume or mute your speaker. So that's the site um, that is publicly available uh, at any time. There is some technical limit to the number of people who can use it simultaneously. But yesterday we had, I think, 17 people on, and it did not seem we were interfering with each other. But what I do know from experience is the more people who are simultaneously listening to essentially broadband, um, the more packet loss you get out of the server. So um, the recordings seem to work okay, and you can go back and retrieve whatever was lost, but your hearing and sometimes uh, visual displays um, will uh, have some distortion due to packet loss once in a while. But uh, today there doesn't seem to be any or very much with seven users. Now, now, one more thing on this site is another very small link right here. This is not the only uh, radio site in the world you can access through here. Um, when we're, we're finished, and I'll take any questions that folks might have, when we're finished here, I'll go and demonstrate the other things you can do just linking through this site. And again, a direct link to this is in the chat. So you don't have to come through a uh, camera in order to get to these folks, but they, they do show on the main page for the camera site. So any questions, I'll be glad to try to answer them um, before we move on. So over to you. So I see a picture over there to the right. Uh, is that a still picture? Uh, can I move the antenna? Um, we cannot move the antenna um, right now uh, for two reasons. It is dedicated to the Artemis mission. And so all remote control is locked out. Um, however, back on the main page for camera, there is a form, unfortunately, uh, for us in the US, the form is in Dutch, but the form uh, can be filled out and you can request time on this dish so that you would be given the password to control it remotely. Most of the use of the dish, as I understand it, is from local control um, in Vingalo, uh, where uh, students and researchers, amateur radio researchers, have scheduled time on the dish. Uh, probably not unlike uh, uh, Stockert and certainly not unlike LTO, we need a control operator present before the dish is moved out of the locked position. Uh, when the moon sets, and essentially Artemis is close to the moon, when the moon sets, this um, tracking will change to the Dutch word for parked. So that answer your question, Ted? Perfect. Uh, I'm comforted that I can't push the wrong button. Thanks. Okay. Anything else? Okay, well, let's go on and um, I'll show you before I uh, sign off here, a couple of other things you can do with the linked site. Now, this, this is a link to the Web SDR organization. 
And again, we have a direct link to this site from uh, on, in the chat. Um, there are currently 164 radio sites around the world that are available for you at any time you want to, to link into. Uh, they're providing, uh, right now we got over 2000 users using those 164 sites and about seven, a little over 700 megahertz of the radio spectrum is accessible. Um, you can scroll down and see everything from uh, another Netherlands site here. The frequencies that are covered, this one covers basically from DC through um, the entire HF, but it only has a mini whip antenna. Some of these, uh, here's one with a small dish. This is a frequency band. Uh, what is that? That would be S band or X band. Um, and I'm not sure what it is being used for but you can go there and find out, but it's essentially looking at satellites. All kinds of sites around the world, and each one of them will show the frequency bands. Some of them are not continuous. This is a good example for one that isn't, and for whatever reason, the people setting up the site decided to limit um, we're not looking, for instance, at the two megahertz band here. We're not looking continuously from um, eight megahertz through 10. Uh, the uh, Vengaloo site is on here somewhere. We can scroll down and find it. Uh, a lot of folks are doing HF. A few people are doing VHF, and a very few people are doing 21 centimeters. <clears throat> there is a process. If you're interested in putting your radio observatory on here, um, you can go to the FAQs. So you'd go to this uh, link and then look for the FAQs, and it will give you instructions for how to get your um, receiver site listed on this um, web SDR organization. So one of the things I have been working on for about three or four years is finding a way that we can feed Little Thompson Observatory uh, 21 centimeter as well as radio meteor um, signals through this site. It's not difficult to do, but uh, our problem is, or limitation, is we don't want to have our dish in actual operation unless we have an operator there and we're not 24 seven equipped. So that would be our hesitation. What we do have at Little Thompson is we have gone to a different organization of SDRs than web SDR, uh, slightly simpler to configure and use called Kiwi SDR. And in the chat, there's a link to that. And we do feed our meteor, uh, I'm sorry, we feed our HF and VLF signals through Kiwi SDR. And uh, we're told that uh, our reception of um, the VLF frequencies for uh, that are frequently used by SuperSID um, can be used by anyone, even without a SuperSID receiver. You simply record our um, stream and then feed it through a super SID uh, processing system. I haven't personally done it, but we've had feedback from folks who said they've been able to access our system during bad signal times in their locations and actually use our signals. It'd be interesting to, to get some good solid feedback from any of you who are super SID gurus on that. 
So that is sort of the end of the presentation, uh, unless anybody has questions. And again, let's see if I can zoom in on where this place is. Jay, if you're on the Kiwi site, uh, how would we find your listing on there? We would look um, well. Yeah, it's in chat, but um, the easiest way to do it, if this will let me do it, is just type in Kiwi SDR. And I think they're a dot org. No, they're a dot com. And all the Kiwi sites in the world are here. And it looks like there are 665 receivers online. And you see why we went with Kiwi as opposed to web SDR. There's a lot more. There was, what, 174. So this is a bigger network. Um, and you can get all the data from here. Our call sign uh, that we're using, the call sign for uh, Little Thompson Observatory is K0LTO. But this receiver, um, when it was set up and we coded it, we used my call sign. So it's W0AIR. It'll search for that call sign, but you can also put in a location. So if you wanted... Um, Kiwi receivers in Germany, for instance, just type in Germany, and they are around the world. But if you know the call sign or the town, um, this will take you to it. So then here is a link. It'll take you to our receiver. Again, it's a click to start. And it looks like the last person to use our site, you put the frequency in here, last person to use it wanted um, an AM broadcast signal. But um, we can go to, let's see if we can go to standard time signals here and let's we'll see if we can get um, WWV, uh, I'm sorry, CHU in Canada. And we don't have good propagation to CHU in Canada. But um, one of the things I like about this site is you can, um, you can get a really, really good view of the entire spectrum. Um, with this waterfall. And what's fun is to, uh, so we're looking from essentially DC on the left up to 30 megahertz. You can see ionosons as they progress across. Um, you can see over the horizon radars pulsing. One of the huge advantages of um, Kiwi SDR, is there are things called extensions in this block here. And again, you don't need to sign up for this. You just need to um, go to a, uh, a web link like this one, and you'll get all this. One of the things you can do with the extensions is you can decode uh, common forms of um, uh, data encoding different uh, ALE, for instance, automatic linking. Um, you can decode uh, some of the amateur radio modes. But the thing I use this for more than anything else is down here, the time delay of arrival. And you can, can simultaneously open multiple Kiwi receivers, put them on a, the frequency of a signal, and in about two minutes or three minutes, you will get a world map triangulating the location of the transmitter. So this has been very, very useful for um, uh, tracking down interference. Um, in a previous life, I worked for uh, Department of Homeland Security. 
we had a very important HF channel that was used for continuity of government communications. And it was being jammed almost 24 seven. Um, we presumed it was hostile jammers. It occurred, and uh, we had called on, on the FCC as well as several military um, radio direction finding stations to help us track down where this was coming from. And um, nobody gave us firm answers after about three days. So I came home, used the TDOA, uh, selected three um, Kiwi sites, and within two minutes found that it was coming from a place called Naval Air Station, Albany, Georgia. <clears throat> so I contacted the NAS Albany, Georgia folks to find out what might be going on. And lo and behold, they had set up a training site for some um, coastal surveillance radar. And they were just teaching students how to use it. Uh, went through a list of US government radio frequencies, listened for a little bit and said, oh, this one doesn't seem to be used. This will be a good training frequency to use. So this can be very, very useful. It's reliable and quite accurate. So all the other things on here are available to you at any time. You can decode, uh, decode uh, slow scan TV, um, as well as uh, some of the exotic modes uh, that most um, analog receivers would never be able to let you have access to. And again, um, just select the site that gives you the, uh, the very best uh, coverage for the frequencies you're interested in. Let's see what might be in Germany. Uh, does it have uh, ACARS decoding? Because uh, uh, you, you, you could go up. Uh, you know, I've never done that, and I don't think it does have ACARS. Um, some, yeah, I'm pretty sure it does not have ACARS. Uh, it mainly focuses on uh, HF modes because most, if not all, these receivers are HF. So you can see there are um, bunches here, you know, probably 70, 50, 75 or more um, receiver sites in Germany. I'm going to click off here because of the, uh, the constant static I'm getting. So any any questions about using this or how we might um, might integrate uh, radio astronomy receiver sites into this kind of a network? Just for interest, uh, let me go back to our own site and um, see if where we can uh, pick up any of the super SID type receptions on a day like this. So various ways to get there. The easiest way is just type in the frequency you want. So I'll go to 25 kilohertz. Whoops. We're on 25 kilohertz. We were until I clicked on the screen. The other way of going to a frequency is to simply um, click on the waterfall and you'll go there. So um, we want to zoom in on that frequency. And the waterfall will show if we're receiving much or anything in and around there takes a little bit of time to uh, adjust the waterfall to these real weak signals, but let's see what we can get. So what we are getting is a 20, whatever this is, 20 something kilohertz, a uh, 15, 14 kilohertz in here. And it looks like we may be getting something in here. 
very often we get solid line traces down through here on good days at our location. You're getting this is in, you're getting in Hawaii, Hawaii. Okay. 21. And sometimes we see some of the um, um, smaller nation submarine transmissions are up in this area. There's nothing there today, apparently. And uh, you on the far end can go ahead and record the audio from here on your own um, you can't scroll down far enough, but you can, there's a button at the bottom that you would see on your own screen. Oh, here it is on this. You can record this locally on your own computer. And unfortunately, it records as a wave file rather than any, any other form of processable digital information. So, uh, as long as you can work with WAV files, that's what you can get. So, any questions on any of this? Jay, uh, the uh, transmitter that you were, uh, you sent emails on that you were trying to get for meteor uh, detection. Yes. You wanna go over uh, that, that thing? Yes. Um, about um, about four years ago, I gave a talk at our Green Bank conference on the Brahms um, meteor system operating in Belgium, but accessible for uh, amateur receivers throughout all of Europe and England, um, <clears throat> and proposed that uh, Sarah look into a chain of similar transmitters in the US. Uh, as a result of that, a group of us, um, Wayne McCain down in Alabama, Adrian Howell in North Carolina, and unfortunately he is passed now. He was a former vice president of SARA and we lost him about two years ago. Um, Chip Sufici in uh, Northern Virginia and myself um, did some experiments trying to find out what power levels might work for the transmitters. And um, if indeed we proceeded with a network um, and tried to determine if it would be possible to triangulate locations of meteors. Most of us who do uh, meteor work like uh, Mike Ode, um, what we're really interested in are counts, as well as maybe investigating the overdense meteors once in a while. But there is a growing interest in correlating um, meteor radio reception with all sky camera networks to do a visual uh, correlation. And a very interesting group of people is trying to find meteors that land on the ground, meteorites in other words, once they've hit the ground, based on radio and radar uh, triangulation combined with all sky cameras. That's a whole different hobby. But what we were looking at as a SARA sub, informal SARA subgroup was, could we set up a chain of 500 watt to 1,000 watt transmitters, generally using the six meter ham band in the US to begin with, and then later migrating to a 49 megahertz experimental license. If we had, for instance, eight of these located in a line, let's say through the central part of the US, um, <clears throat> how many amateur uh, radio stations uh, could access reflections from those. 
you know, would eight be enough? Would we need 25? Uh, or could we get away with three? So um, as the experiment progressed, Wayne set up in Alabama a 1000 watt transmitter that sent a continuous 1000 watt carrier or a CW tone, to be precise, a CW signal. Um, and probably over a, an eight or 12 hour period of time of those, of that period of transmission in Colorado, I picked up maybe two meteors at our receiving site. That's to be expected. The distance is actually too far for any kind of reliable meteor reception, but it did show that either meteors or satellites, something that appeared to be meteors, reflected his signal over that, um, whatever it is, 1200 kilometer path. Adrian Howell in North Carolina, quite a bit closer, um, was receiving several an hour. And Chip Sufici in Northern Virginia received many, many fewer. Um, we then tried using the Canadian Meteor Observation Radar System, and none of us received any signals at all from that. It's uh, essentially an HF radar. I can give you the frequencies, but the 17, 19, and 29 megahertz, I believe the frequencies are. I have the exact frequencies here if anybody is interested. <clears throat> the uh, 29 megahertz should work because they have a um, 10 kilowatt transmitter, but I've never been able to receive that signal. So it could be it's intermittent. Um, could be it, it's offline. It's operated by the Western Ontario University uh, Physics Department. <clears throat> Pardon me. So um, I believe what we established through the experiments with Wayne's transmissions is that it is practical to use 1000 watt transmitters um, to provide maybe a 300 uh, kilometer radius maybe a little more, but 300 kilometer radius uh, for other people to receive meteor reflections. And our impetus for doing this, just uh, to make sure everybody wonders, why are you doing this? Because we've already got a lot of, of transmitters out there. Um, the US and Canada, Mexico moved away from analog TV uh, transmitters to uh, digital commercial TV transmitters. When they did that, the um, power levels of the pilot carriers um, was greatly reduced. The carrier of the traditional TV signal was essentially the power of the broadcast station. You could have a million watts effective radiated power or more. Many of the stations were much more than a million watts, but you could have a megawatt transmitter and that made it very good on TV channels two through about six. Uh, very, very good for looking for uh, meteor and aircraft reflections. When we went to digital format, the pilot carriers now were only one of those many, many digital tones being transmitted. And the power level is just simply a fraction. So you may have a megawatt transmitter but only 20,000 watts going into that uh, pilot carrier. That combined with the even the more serious problem of in urban and semi-urban areas, almost every one of those lower channels has a local station and you can't, and so the local station signal overpowers uh, a distant transmitter's uh, reflection from a meteor. So we were looking at a system that could be controlled by amateurs for amateurs um, with a partnership, perhaps with colleges, universities, community colleges, and organizations like SARA to operate a chain of stations on discrete frequencies that would not be interfered with, with known power levels and exact uh, 
coordinates so that triangulation of meteor reflections would be a possibility. So um, until we do the second round of testing with more people involved, uh, about the best data we have from the US uh, comes from the Wayne McCain and Sarah experiments. But we're tremendously interested in looking at Brahms and all the successes they have in Europe with, again, fairly low power transmitters in known locations. Um, one of the drawbacks to running a thousand watt transmitter is just do the math and it's going to be expensive to run that thing on electricity 24 hours a day. We have found a cheap source of power amplifiers, and that is broadcast station uh, transmitter modules. Usually, even if it's a, a megawatt station, they're going to have thousand watt modules in the transmitter section. Uh, they generally run on 48 volts DC. And so you simply get one of those things, which uh, sort of is about the size of a, um, oh, um, a laptop um, in width and maybe twice that length. So they're not really big units. Um, uh, 48 volts is not hard to come by. You can put in series a group of 12 volt power supplies, or you can do the easy way and just get a commercial uh, computer server room power supply, which puts out 28 of oh, 48 volts, um, and then drive the thousand watt amplifier with about a 10 watt amateur radio transmitter or a purpose built CW transmitter. So building the stations would be fairly simple. Paying for their operation is more complex. Plus, with putting a thousand watts into the antenna uh, to meet FCC requirements, we would need to do the uh, RFI, uh, RF exposure uh, calculation and make sure that the antenna is far enough away from occupants as well as isolated from people who might accidentally uh, come in contact with it. So it needs to be generally on a rooftop where no people are uh, or in a fenced area away from buildings. So there's some physical limitations to what we can do to actually bring this about. But as a concept, um, I guess I'll be proposing at some point that Sarah establish a formal committee to look into whether this is a practical thing to do or not. Great. Any questions? If Any you're volunteers? Using, are, go ahead. If you're using amateur radio bands for that, that's not person-to-person -person communication. Wouldn't that be considered broadcasting? Uh, no, it isn't. Um, in fact, it falls under the same uh, FCC category as the existing amateur radio propagation beacons. Um, it's a scientific use of amateur radio. We need to meet the identif station identification requirements. Um, so essentially every 10 minutes, the station would need to pause its continuous signal and send out either digitally or by Morse code, a station identifier, and then go back for another nine and three quarters minutes of solid transmission but it falls under the category of using amateur radio for scientific investigation. And it is perfectly legal and allowed. Now um, we have to coordinate the frequencies that we would use so that we're not interfering with other existing activities, but there is a process for radio frequency coordination on the hand bands. Now our thought was we would run this as a proof of concept using amateur licenses uh, because we can just do it. We can turn it on this afternoon if need be. But uh, for a permanent system, we'd want to move to 49 megahertz and get an experimental license. And the experimental license, one license could cover multiple installations. Generally, we could get a five-year permit that would be renewable if we showed a valid scientific reason for doing it. 
Anything else? All right. Anybody want to be on the uh, the new committee, uh, uh, CJ, uh, and uh, especially if you want to uh, volunteer your site for a, you know a transmitter. Yeah, and my um, contact information is in the chat. All right. Okay, Jay, outstanding presentation. Uh, very precise. I loved it. So uh, great job. Thank you. Thank you. And anybody with questions, please go ahead and email me. And certainly if you want to volunteer to work on the radio meteor um, investigation, go ahead and email me and I'll uh, try to put you in touch with everybody else I know of that's interested. All right. Um, that's all we had uh, scheduled for today's uh, session. Uh, if you guys want to um, ask questions in chat, uh, you know, I'll leave the uh, site up here a little longer. Anybody have any uh, new things you've done? And uh, by the way, how did you like the uh, um, Drake's Lounge Australia? The, the guys who uh, tuned in or saw the video. Uh, looks like those guys are uh, have a lot of uh, a lot of capability that uh, we're going to tune into. That was a good presentation. I uh, I missed it. I forgot they were a day ahead instead of a day behind. So I tuned in, what was it, five o'clock Saturday instead of five o'clock Friday afternoon. But uh, so, but that was a great presentation. They had it very well organized. Uh, they did. Just an FYI, I finally finished the UCF radio telescope and it works. That was quite a challenge uh, working around the RFI generated by the, the new cell phone tower from help from Jack Lobinger and um, Wolfgang Sanders and Bob Strickland's ideas. The, uh, the tuned uh, Cantana work extremely well. So it's on the air. Is uh, what, what basics on the Cantana could you uh, let us know what, I mean, what was the revelation on how to, to get the dimensions on that? Oh, um, I've got a few slides if you want to see. I won't take too much. Time. Three or four slides. Let me see. Um, let me see if I can uh, figure out how to share. Share screen. Oops. I don't know. Does that come up? Yep. Okay. So uh, I think Jack gave me this resource, and this is off the City League's website. And and these dimensions absolutely overlay the information that I have down here. This is an interactive calculator, and so basically, it's it is six inches in diameter and ten inches long, and. Uh, Instead of using tin cans, um, I cut it out of some uh, pie pans and um, aluminum flashing. And so it's 10 inches by 6 inches, and uh, all the other dimensions were worked out pretty well, and it looks like that. And um, the, big, the big factor was between the loop feed and the cantana is the roll-offs down here due to the tune cavity so it's a huge difference it's nearly 40 db or 30 db less interference down here at the 750 and so that uh prevented the whoops the um lna from getting uh saturated and blocking so it started out looking like this. It now looks like that. And uh, gotten some good data. So it works. Because it was a really nasty environment. So the uh, the length of the, the 10 inch length of the cantenna is what caused the filter action to happen. Is that the it's, way it works? Yeah, it's, it's evidently, yeah. All the parameters 
if you if you lock in here you can play with you can this is interactive so you can play with the numbers and it shows you the the cutoff frequencies for the different modes and and it it matched what uh the SETI league um hardware specified so i just built it to fit built it to match this and doing the testing it worked nice it tuned up well and um performance and so that is what uh, attenuated the uh, the blocking or the uh, LNA saturation and allowed the signals to return. Okay. Okay. Yeah, and if you could put that uh, that link on the chat, that'd be great for everybody, I think, too. Which one? And, uh, any uh, with that, that uh, uh, analyzer or the. Uh, oh, okay. Are we are. Yeah, I'm back. Yeah. Um, anybody have any questions uh, for Alex?